Good afternoon, bona tarda, bona tarda a tothom. Benvingudes i benvinguts. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for your visit. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Gracias, Deputy Mayor. Thank you very much for, for attending this, uh, this conference we are having in the framework of our Global Cities program, taking a look at the war in Ukraine from a different perspective, from the perspective of uh, its urban dimension, how it, of course, we've been following very carefully the news and, of course, the first impact that any war has is on um, the civil population, which is, of course, mostly located in, in cities, and Ukraine has not been an exception to that. We've seen uh, terrible news uh, coming from Bucha, from Mariupol, from Kiev, uh, and the outskirts of Kiev, from Kharkiv, many cities in Ukraine, of course, that are um, undergoing the most tragic consequences of any uh, armed conflict of any war, and in this case, a brutal war of, aggra of aggression that, that Russia is launching. Also using um, mechanisms of war that uh, had uh, should have been forgotten for a long time, but that are unfortunately, uh, again, uh, uh, targeting civilians first and foremost as an objective of war. We've seen that with children, we've seen that with women. We are seeing that on many, too many occasions uh, in the four months uh, that have already um, uh, elapsed since the start of the of the invasion. So our uh, ambition with this uh, event today, in the in the framework of the of the Global Cities program, was precisely to have this uh, outlook at the at at how Ukrainian cities, on the one hand, are suffering from the war of aggression, but also how um, uh, cities and, and 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 metropolitan areas as well can be uh, places where uh, dynamics in international politics can be um, uh, taken or can be uh, uphold in a different in a different direction. Of course, we've seen also uh, many uh, partnerships between cities as well, and paying particular attention to the cities of Ukraine and uh, trying to devise ways in which cities can cooperate in a one-to-one -one basis, but also to strengthen city diplomacy in times of conflict, in times of uh, war, and of course, trying to provide for this, um, this alternative vision to the war in Ukraine, which is very much in line with what the City Council of Barcelona uh, has been doing, but also is one of the objectives of the Global Cities Program of CEDAW. The Global Cities Program of CEDAW, which aims to look at uh, international relations through the prism, through the eyes, of non-traditional state and international organization actors. That is the role of cities, the role of uh, civil society as well in shaping the international arena, in shaping the international relations. And that is the, 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 the objective of, of our Global Cities Program. After that, we will have, after the first uh, um, launch of this, of this discussion, we will have a, a round table focusing a bit more into detail on, on city diplomacy in a new era of conflict. But before doing that, let me thank Catherine Kluver Ashbrook, uh, who has been kind enough to come to Barcelona and participate live uh, as, uh, as an expert on, on urban aspects, but also as, as, as former director of, of the German Council of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations, sorry, Affairs is here. Um, uh, so to participate live in this in this discussion and provide with a keynote, uh, with a keynote speech. But before doing that, let me turn to Laia Bonet, Deputy Mayor, you all know her, Deputy Mayor of, of, uh, of the Barcelona City Council, also for the 2030 Agenda, uh, the Digital Transition, Sports and Territory and Metropolitan Coordination. So plenty of roles in one uh, only hat, but most important for us, the responsible for international affairs of the Barcelona City Council. So Laia, over to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. It's Always a pleasure to be here, even if we have to tackle a very difficult issue. So good afternoon uh, to all. It's been a while uh, since we started to have in-person international meetings again, but I'm still glad uh, to see things going back or starting going back to normal after two very, very difficult years. So welcome to Barcelona for those of you who have come uh, to, to have this possibility of having a debate here. personally here, we are very, very happy to host you. This seminar was conceived 
a couple of months ago, uh, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine was consistently headline news uh, on all the news programs. The world has now evolved uh, into a more localized and probably long-term conflict. But this doesn't change the ethical and geopolitical implications of the invasion as a threat to both international order and living conditions as we know them. Back then, we clearly saw three main consequences of the war for and in cities. First, the need to welcome Ukrainian refugees fleeing their country. That was the first uh, answer we had to uh, give for those who were fleeing their country, a very, very difficult decision. Welcoming them to our cities, to Barcelona specifically in our case, and providing them with adequate serv services was and still is the right thing to do uh, without any doubt. Just as in 2015, though we encountered major challenges as city government to manage the refugees' inflow. They can be summed up in refugees becoming our neighbors. And we as proximity administration having an ethical duty uh, to look after them, while basically any relevant legal competence remains in the hands of the national and regional government. This sort of administrative and humanitarian mismatches have been already extensively discussed and analyzed also in the past. And I will not go into the details of it, but they are, of course, worth mentioning, I think. The second implication for cities and our populations are the socio-economic socio consequences of the war. And this means, this means essentially inflation. Life is now harder for our neighbors than it was uh, before February 24th. Living costs are higher and raising, and so are the costs uh, for managing and delivering basic services, such as public transport, just to mention one. And here again, local administration can only go that far in putting in place policies to support populations in this context of crisis. We need bold and ambitious responses at the national and European level to strengthen social safety nets and protect most vulnerable populations from growing poorer in the, in the coming months. And then there is a third urban dimension of this war, which hasn't such an impact on uh, people's li uh, lives, but uh, which reflects cities' international roles, the so-called city diplomacy. In Barcelona, in the early days of the war, the City Council adopted a unanimous resolution condemning the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation. We called on Russia to withdraw uh, its troops from the country and to respect international law and human rights. Based on that resolution, we started a city diplomacy strategy aimed at denouncing Russia's responsibility for the war and conditioning our relationship uh, with Russian institutions to the restoration of peace and territorial integrity in Ukraine. This strategy started by cutting our institutional relations with the Russian General Consulate in Barcelona, which means not inviting the representatives to city events and not attending, uh, not attending um, their, uh, their events, but of course, continuing to provide technical uh, assistance to Russian citizens in Barcelona. And since we also wanted to signal very, very clearly that our problem is with the Russian government, not with the Russian population in Barcelona, we also met with uh, representatives of that community and the organized opposition to Putin in the city. Something that carried a bit more of internal discussion was whether we should cut ties also with Russian cities we work or had twinning agreements with. Uh, those are by basically, in our case, St. Petersburg. 
uh, with which we have a twinning agreement, but also Moscow, with which, uh, which, uh, which was part of the city's coalition for digital rights. In these discussions, it was argued that cities must preserve ties among them, regardless of national context, as a means to keep a space for alternative forms or, uh, of diplomacy. I was not convinced by this, uh, though. Uh, I certainly favor building and preserving bridges. I think it is very important always here at home, but also internationally. But I'm also convinced that against an authoritarian state where the elites governing large cities are indistingu indistinguishable from those ruling the country, there is not an actual local level and a national level, but rather they are the same. As a matter of fact, the mayor of Moscow was Putin's chief of staff and his deputy during Putin's premiership. Uh, and the governor of St. Petersburg has also held several federal and regional responsibilities during Putin's tenure as both deputy mayor of St. Petersburg and president of Russia. So to us, it was clear when there is, when there is an, a space uh, for a city diplomacy that can actually escape national dynamics, and that is clearly the case uh, in the case of Russia, uh, we must consistently side with human rights and the rule of law. That is why we have suspended our training agreement with St. Petersburg and also suspended Moscow's membership uh, of the city's coalition for digital rights, a shared decision with Amsterdam, which also co-leads the coalition with Barcelona, with us. So apologies please, uh, for taking this time to share the political process uh, behind our reactions to the invasion of Ukraine, but I thought it could offer uh, a useful frame for your discussion. And uh, so uh, now I really look forward to hearing um, uh, Catherine's uh, keynote. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry because after your keynote, I have to leave for a meeting, but uh, I'm sure that there will be a very, very fruitful panel after your keynote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Laia, and, and thank you very much also for highlighting uh, in the very last part of your, of your uh, first uh, intervention uh, how too often we've been focusing on, on, on cities as an alternative to national governments, but sometimes that is not the case. And we in Europe have tended to think always that we could work with cities when governments, national governments were difficult partners to deal with. But that is not always the case. And thank you very much for highlighting that uh, as well, as well as for, of course, uh, starting to discuss how cities have become places of refuge, how cities are suffering the consequences, but how also how city diplomacy is an important component. So before, um, uh, Moving on, first things first, uh, Catherine Kluver with uh, her keynote will be able to provide us some further details on the war in Ukraine, the, Euro the urban dimension of a geopolitical threat, which is the topic of our discussion today, uh, and elaborate on the different components that I'm sure Laia has already started uh, to raise with us. So over to you, thank you very much. Well, first of all, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Laia, for, for having me back in Barcelona. It's my second time, and I've spent more time in Barcelona now than already than I have my first time. And it's with great pleasure, first of all, because Barcelona, in my estimation, is a vanguard in urban diplomacy and in building sustainable uh, transnational networks. So congratulations to you for understanding uh, the capacity of urban diplomacy, first and foremost. And then secondly, it's great, with great joy that I'm always in the streets of Barcelona when I can see a beautiful building built by Richard Meyer, Whose, whose inspiration and his understanding of urban space were what pulled me or would constantly created an environment for me between international relations and architecture and urban space and the necessity of grounding civic life in urban space. And so it was with great joy that I saw Barcelona's uh, modern art museum. So thank you for having me. Paul said it in his introductory remarks, war has been urban since the dawn of time. Because of course, cities were once nation states and when they fought one another, nations 
sought one another. And then over the course of history, certainly in the cataclysmic two world wars that we suffered, they became prizes. It was the territory that had to be claimed, but the cities, their capture, their destruction, and then ultimately their rebuilding that made them the crown jewels. And, after, because, and, and because of how detrimental the destruction was, not only to the security environment, but also, of course, to the human architecture, the human network, the human richness of the urban is where the sort of the concepts of international law and the protections of civilian and wartime, and Paul mentioned that exactly accurately, where that came about, including the institutions to protect said rights of the individual in wartime, including the United Nations, but of course also the International Committee of the Red Cross, and those that we consider now to be the last frontline negotiators in a conflict where many international actors have pulled out of territorial negotiations uh, themselves. But whole-scale destruction of cities and urban fabric weakens the entire system. And we saw that, of course, and then I think the greatest declaration uh, of uh, an idea that you know one sore, one pain point can create pain for an entire economy and an entire global understanding of, the, of, of, a, of an econ economic system was, of course, the Marshall Fund and the desire to rebuild the destroyed economies of, uh, of Europe such that the United States could prosper. Again, decisions of interest, decisions of power, but also decisions of investment in human fabric, human security, and human infrastructure. But now we've seen in a more modern incarnation that neither of these rules put in place and governed by international institutions hold fealty to the relations that, and the relationships and the realities on the ground. Kabul, Aleppo, Baghdad, all of those cities have shown what Mary Caldor refers to as systems and ecosystems of violence and war. And we have let them fester. And so it is perhaps no surprise that in, in planning a larger scale strategy for what is now a war of attrition, what was a war of aggression and an invasion, for 137 days, we didn't in fact get what we suspected we might, and Paul's made the allusion to it, which is a 21st century war, a war on all efforts and all lines of efforts, cyber, hybrid, military, kinetic, and then ultimately, of course, destruction uh, of, of the urban space. We got first and foremost when the plans of Vladimir Putin failed, which is to have territorial capture with the prize of cities, a detrimental change in tactics, which is the ultimate destruction of Ukrainian cities, with the emphasis on degrading, dismantling, denationalizing. And that is because, and Paul has made reference to it already, that is where urban life, where civic infrastructure, human security, and of course, cultural history and history reside. And of course, nothing is more important to a revisionist power like the, the Russian Federation at this point is rewriting the history of modern Ukraine. So instead of, and I will talk, of course, it had elements of hybrid, of cyber, of kinetic and military action, but it didn't have those elements at scale in part because of the strength of Ukrainian resistance. And I'll talk a little bit about what begat that Ukrainian resistance. But what we see now is a whole scale, full on, complete and utter assault on Ukrainian cities, forcible removal of Ukrainian citizens to Russia, a renaming and a replacement. So again, degrade, dismantle, denationalize, removal, remain, renaming replacement. That is the tactic of modern urban warfare through the Russian eye. And it might not yet be over because we see Russia making, of course, incursions and expanding its territorial hold in the east and now increasingly in the south, of course, reinforcing uh, what it already held through the annexation of Crimea and the territories uh, in, in the east. But Vladimir Klitschko, the brother of the mayor of Kiev, also said, of course, 
they will come back for Kiev. That is a prize. It is the heart of the country. And if we let them, they will come back. So for all the tools in the 21st century arsenal, the tools which we were expecting to have a far greater impact, what is much more surprising is, again, the degree of resilience, preparation, networking, and narrative mustered by the Ukrainians to this revisionist power and the tactics of old. And what is the ultimate, at least interim and medium term, goal of the Russian Federation is to create a system of violence, this ecosystem of war. Because as we learn in Grozny, as we learned in Aleppo, and we see every day in the division of Aleppo, keeping the level of insecurity high, keeping the level of volatility high, bringing in unsavory actors from gangs to, uh, to uh, hired sectarian fighters, to, uh, to you know, mundane criminals, keeps a city, keeps an infrastructure, keeps a system in perpetual fear. And perpetual fear creates perpetual conflict. It creates perpetual frozen uh, realities. And that ultimately is, at least in the interim and medium term, what I believe uh, the, Russian, uh, the Russian Federation, led by, uh, led by Vladimir Putin, wants to create a social condition of war. Sexual violence, gang violence, you've already mentioned all the, the, the connections that come with that uh, in the ecosystem of war. The danger, of course, in the absence of ceasefire, negotiation, security guarantees, and the application of the full force of international law is that it will continue to perpetuate the destruction of Ukrainian civil and human infrastructure in a piecemeal fashion. Randomized attacks keeping urban populations in perpetual terror. $60 billion is the toll of the current physical destruction across the country. Destruction and perpetual insecurity as a way of claiming victory. Because the destruction of cities in the 21st century is the attack of a network of connections, and I think you made that clear. The diaspora, the energy components, all the elements now that we have seen as weaponized interdependence, <coughs> the crises still to come for cities not only in the West and the North to address, but also in the global South, the cities that have effectively either diplomatically negated that these, this conflict is one around democracy, autocracy, rights, control, and access, uh, or who are so dependent on both Russia and Chinese influence that they dare not speak up. But because of how Russia has seen an, an, abil an ability to motivate the resources of weaponized or weaponizing interdependence, Clearly, more conflict, global and uh, global and spreading conflict, is to come on the backs of what is the destruction of Ukrainian cities. So, to attack cities in Ukraine is to impact cities across Europe and the world. By attacking one city, you attack a network of actors, including other cities. You see now in Germany, for instance, the big story over the last two days is the cities fear who fear bankruptcy over the coming uh, months and into the fall because they own their own energy providers, their own energy resources. And that is one way a fiscal, um, fiscal uh, identity and fiscal independence from the national and federal structures. And if they cannot control their own energy flows, if they cannot uh, foresee their gas and oil uh, storage units, um, then that will make it very difficult to uphold simple fiscal realities uh, and the management of the urban environs. So that is not to say, of course, that Russia didn't attempt first and foremost to bring these elements into a wider strategy, as I mentioned. It did perpetuate hybrid attacks, issuing Russian passports in eastern Ukraine, beginning a full-scale Russification that, bega that begat then ultimately, of course, the transportation, the relocation, the forced relocation now of Ukrainian urban citizens. And of course, the attempt to weaken the reception capacities, particularly of European neighboring countries, uh, Poland and Hungary with its maneuvers in Belarus ahead of uh, the actual physical invasion of Ukraine. It also launched 200 separate cyber attacks perpetuated by state and non-state actors on Ukrainian uh, targets, including on the electricity plant in Sumy, orchestrated a massive data leak 
uh, for the city of Lviv, as you know, the reception area and the receptor is a receiving city for many of the internally displaced. Um, all of this data, which then a few weeks later appeared on Russian telegram channels and is now being used in the efforts to cleanse and denazify Ukraine. So then, of course, in repeated cyber attacks on the Ukrainian rail system. Again, let me remind you what that Ukrainian rail system is being used for, to get refugees out of the country and to get heavy material, artillery, um, and sort of the mechanics of war back into the country. That was the attempt. It failed. But then, of course, the Russian Federation and uh, various actors working for the Russian Federation kidnapped 13 mayors, nine of whom remain in captivity and or missing, to do what the rest of us have often not realized, to collect urban <laughs> intelligence, to create uh, an understand or a sense of insecurity in the confidence of citizens, to replace command and control structures, and begin again the dismantling of civic infrastructure, uh, civic transportation, uh, and the orchestration and setup of camps across the Ukrainian and Russian border. And of course, it engaged in wholesale disinformation efforts towards its own citizens, the Russian speaking population in Ukraine, that, but then of course, finding willing uh, participants in its messaging of around its special military operation across the European Union and in international media. So it attempted all of these elements but the remarkable thing is, of course, Ukrainian resistance to this. And why is that the case? And why was that? Uh, why was Ukraine able to hold out in the way it has um, in an effort to not create uh, as quickly as one might assume this end goal of an ecosystem of urban warfare? Because, of course, Ukraine had been at war for seven years and has been at war for seven years. So the resilience that you see among the Ukrainian population, the capacity to form, to use logos, ethos, and pathos, which I think Vladimir Zelensky has framed and sort of a mod given a modern face, appealing to not only the moral imperative of aid and engagement, but also the reality of problem solving on the ground, asking cities to advocate for, uh, for Ukrainian national objectives, including um, the provision of heavy weaponry into the city. And he does this, of course, um, in context with uh, Ukrainian mayors and their own voices, uh, giving rise to an understanding, a physical and emotional and informational understanding of these places. You mentioned the Bucha, Kharkiv, Kiev. And he said, on June 15th, 2022, making his case to the Czech parliament, Russia is not interested only in our cities of Mariupol, Severodonetsk, Kharkiv, and Kiev, no. Its ambitions are directed at a vast area from Warsaw to Sofia. And he does this, and again, he mentions the, I, the cities in the European Union in part to rattle Czech parliamentarians, of course, into taking greater action on behalf of his country, both accelerating uh, the capacities of NATO and the delivery of materiel, but also, of course, on humanitarian aid and on EU um, uh, fundamental uh, um, support around uh, energy, oil, and you'll remember the, the fact that um, the, the, the gap or the, the, the connection um, or bringing the Ukraine onto the European grid, all of those were elements of pressure that he used. And yet um, what, what is most interesting is a sort of three and fourfold tactic that then Ukraine has embraced in part through its mayors in creating preparation and training, partnering with new actors, including with technology providers, with its own businesses, with the NATO Center of Cyber Excellence. The reason the cyber attacks were by and large thwarted in the way they were is because Ukraine as a national, as a nation state, but also Ukrainian cities formed new networks for themselves, purpose-driven and uh, useful to their own objectives. Leadership, the concerted use of global diplomacy, but again, a look at what kind of leverage and influence networks the country had through city relationships. And I think one of the most beautiful examples is a letter that the mayor of Birmingham received from the mayor of Zaporizhia that reminded the mayor of Birmingham that way back in the 40s, Zaporizhia and Birmingham had been sister cities. 
And wouldn't Birmingham now like to take up the cause of Zaporizhia? And I'll recall to you that Zaporizhia is the location of the largest um, effectively energy uh, 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 providing uh, facility in all of Europe and, uh, and as such became an immediate target of the Russians when it came to, again, following through with their uh, tactic of systematic degradation. And then, of course, aid and arms, this idea that you would push for continued international military and humanitarian aid, but that through the voices of mayors, and I'll recall to you, and many of you will remember, um, the, the, the faces of some of these kidnapped mayors and Melitopol and other places who then directly had access to European societies, made jobs of urban leaders here much easier when it was a call to pressure national governments or multilateral um, institutions to cut ties with Russian cities, as you mentioned, to embrace Europe Ukrainian cities effectively as partners, to begin to work with thinking about altering the economic, uh, the economic and employment situation at home. And we've saw, seen many, um, both local and nation state uh, changes to things like employment law and refugee uh, provisions, as much as that can be done in the local context such that Ukrainians can find employ. Because we know from our experience, not least with the Syrian refugee crisis, as the IRC estimates, once displaced, once forcibly removed, immigrants and refugees spend 20 years within a settling community. That changes the face, that changes the civic infrastructure, and that changes the social conditions of receiving communities. So you saw these, these mayors become wartime leaders in the way that they had not been prepared for, but the condition um, of ongoing resilience building over the past seven years, the fact that leadership was devolved to them in the way that it was uh, actually, quote unquote, got done what you are now seeing, which is to see, to say, a European and Western urban response that has a symbolic character, Ukrainian flags flying from public buildings from Sydney to so Tokyo to San Diego. It has the advocacy component and the advocacy has gotten to be much more intense, much more spe specialized and much more concrete. And I'll point to you only, or I'll point you only to um, the, what, they're, what mayors have been calling the joint call from Mariupol, uh, as Barcelona will know well. The idea that Cities, it's cities' role to pressure national governments to create greater breadth in energy independence and energy transition. And on top of that, change, a, change their entire energy financing system to rethink about how the energy, the re, Renew Europe energy funds will be used, will be distributed and be delivered to European cities so that they can make their own decisions on energy provision and vice versa, bring in Ukrainian communities in thinking about rebuilding and think and, and their their own energy um, their own energy uh, systems and their own basic infrastructure to to achieve the kind of level of human security that will be necessary for long term rebuilding. They have used their European counterparts to tell their stories, as you did so aptly here today, Leila. And uh, they are pushing again on very concrete initiatives for beginning to push on concrete initiatives for rebuilding. And I'll talk about those in a second. But more importantly, they have looked at this seven years of resilience building within Ukrainian, the Ukrainian urban fabric, and they have begun to do that homework themselves. Because if it in fact is to be believed what Vladimir Zelensky says, and we can argue about whether or not that is the case, what is clear is that conflict, whether it begets from the outside through Russian aggression or through the phenomena of density, of climate change, of terrorism, conflict will be urban for the time to come. And the degree to which an urban fabric is resilient will make or break whether or not an urban fabric can survive medium and long term. So an attack on Ukraine begat the city of, pushed the city of San Diego to overhaul its entire cyber infrastructure. It pushed cities in Germany to rethink their capacities toward energy storage. It 
pushed cities across the globe to think about how they might deal with issues of inequality, inflation, and uh, separations within their own societies if, in fact, um, this gaming that the Russian Federation is doing around food security and around energy security is exacerbated. How do you restore inequality? Uh, how do you restore and maintain equality, <coughs> fairness, and sort of an idea of urban civic democratic life that is functional and allows you to deliver both basic services, but also to care for um, the functionality of, of, of urban democratic voice? So urban diplomacy in wartime does become an extension of national policy because where you have seen the greatest shifts has been in the cities who have bought into the narrative of democracy, autocracy, weaknesses and volatility, which is to say that cities in the liberal West have followed suit in terms of their national governments, but figured out individual tactics to increase, support, deliver security to their, in some cases, actual Ukrainian counterparts and or Ukrainian cities for whom the ability to, to combine this logos, ethos, pathos piece to build both on empathy and morality has worked. But you see the breaking point, of course, when you think about urban networks that combine cities of the global south. So where the hope for rebuilding Ukraine is in part that it will that that you'll have a leap dynamic. So you'll be able to create longer term, medium and long term in Ukraine, a green and sustainable economy um, centered around sustainable energy resources with greater independencies from fossil fuels. C40, the leading network of cities around the globe, Barcelona is a member, has said absolutely nothing about the war in Ukraine. And they have said nothing because a large part of these cities are African, they're Chinese in some cases, they are member cities of the global south or Latin American, where dependency relationships on supply chains from Russia, on supply chains from China, and I will underscore to you what this audience doesn't need to know is that of course in the application of the six plus sanction packages, Russia and China have grown together beyond the friendship treaty from February 7th in a practical way around technology provision, the security of supply chains, raw earth, uh, raw materials and rare minerals in a way that increases the dependency of certain parts of the global south even more on authoritarian countries. And so the frontier beyond where we are right now in dealing with the critical and immediate emergencies, urban to urban, network to network, will have to be how we close the chasm between north and south, this idea of the fact that you know, colonial, colonial memories of old are what they are, but dependency relations are the same. So how do we square those relations such that cities either are liberated to take action and or uh, can negotiate with the national level uh, to give them greater hand and greater radius of action uh, in the international sphere. By 2030, and this estimate still holds post COVID, over 60% of the world's population will be urbanized. All the problems that we discussed, pandemic, terrorism, climate change, everything is exacerbated by density. Everything is made faster by technology. The effects of inequality, sectarian strife, terrorism are more likely to be sparks of conflict within cities, which gets to the NATO definition of what urban warfare is, than wars of aggression and wars of attrition as we've seen uh, of the Russian Federation impose on Ukraine. Best case scenario is that out of this crisis, if not before, or we use this crisis in the way that we haven't used crises before. Best case scenario is that out of this situation emerges an integrated response mechanism between all layers and levers of government based on foresight, based on scenario planning and supported by new modes of public financing. Some of which you're seeing mayors led by the Visegrad four mayors see emerge in Brussels. They are negotiating and advocating very strongly 
that in the absence of rule of law, and this applies to Ukraine, as a member and candidate, stat, uh, um, as a as a possible uh, as a future mayor of the European Union, currently under candidate status, as it applies to EU members, Poland and Hungary, funds be funneled not to national governments, but be funneled to those entities that can still uphold the rule of law, which are its cities. So, based on a desire to uphold urban democracy, to uphold democratic principles, values, multi-stakeholder formats, in finding the kind of solutions to the global challenges that we have just enumerated, whether they are uh, the remnants of classic tectonic shifts in international relations around power and interest, as we're seeing uh, it play out in the conflict in Ukraine, or whether they're based around transnational issues and our whole of society incidents, the learning has to be that this is, the response has to be whole of government. And so, Make no mistake, in a globalized world, securities, interdependencies, traditional conflicts, they're by no means a thing of the past. NATO has rethought its entire strategic concept from a viewpoint of resilience back to a viewpoint of deterrence that incorporates some of the visions of resilience, but leans much more heavily on deterrence. So while nation states will be captured by this idea of preserving security through traditional methods, cities and the component stakeholders, which they can convene in the way that no others can, they hold the multiple, they hold multiple means of bringing across intelligence, early warning, uh, and fundamentally solutions to some of the biggest global challenges. I've written elsewhere that they're really the seismographs. Cities are the seismographs of the global challenges and they're incubators of global solutions. By systematically fortifying in the way that this crisis is causing uh, for individual cities, their own resources, their external networks, including civil society, business, research, university, migrant minority organizations holding um, fealty and truth to urban pluralism, by finding the right technological resources that retain their openness and access to vital information and by presenting themselves to the nation state as the incubator of a different sort of intelligence, cities will be able to further increase their role in international relations. Conversely, nation states, as we're realizing, are beholden to listening. Democracy, in the fight between a democracy and autocracy, if you hold that principle to be a functional idea, cannot be realized without the very locus of the agora, and that is the city. I just participated in the drafting of a new piece of um, implementing effectively legislation around building uh, within the US State Department an office of city and state diplomacy. And that is, in my mind, where every foreign ministry needs to come to. This idea that you cannot achieve your fundamental social and sociological goals in the United States case, of course, the implementation of the Build Back Better plan and the Biden agenda to lift the middle class back into functionality and restore America's role as the shining city on a hill if you don't do that with cities. And if you don't understand the intelligence that they bring through global investments, through uh, their own interactions with the world, whether it's, like, as I said, on the economic sphere, on research, uh, their universities, their people, the multiplicity and, and widened idea of their plurality, if you do not use systematically the intelligence that cities are bringing to you, and if you don't coordinate that in a way that makes it useful for, again, American security, American economic prosperity, and the functionality of American pluralism. So international relations will remain a sphere where power and interest and money remain <coughs> fundamental currencies. But cities over the past 15 years have realized their own national interests and their own power in the locus of their own democracy, the strength of and resilience of their own democracy, where nation states are failing their own populations. And we see this after survey after survey, whether it's in whether it's an NED survey, a Pew survey, or any European survey, 
Cities confirm every day, all but daily, even in systems that can be defined more as autocracies than democracies, that they have interest, that they have power, and that they are willing through formation of networks and individual connection to use that power, if need be, as we see in the Visegrad Four, in negotiating against their own national environments. So expanding city diplomacy and urban networks, creating a layer and capacity of urban leadership through training and through connection, because let's face it, what we're asking mayors to do is to do more than keep the lights on, keep the water clean, keep the air clean, and keep the schools open. We're now asking them truly to do what begets a 21st century global and globalized, hyper-globalized world which is to look out for their own interests and the national interests and those of democracy and democracy loci like them, of the traditional urban uh, agora. So city diplomacy has its limitations, of course it does. But in a world of tectonic political shifts, in a world where national interests around territorial control collide with transnational problems, pandemics, migration, the movement of people, the weakening of international law, the connection between the individual, the connection in the agora, the connection within a city becomes one of the highest, uh, the highest connective tissues. It's essential to the future of our democracies and essential to the creation of long-term human security. So it is worth investing both from a nation state perspective and a city perspective and by bringing together different types of resources, motivating them now, and we'll talk in the panel discussion about urban reconstruction and how that might work, we will set the stage for a renewal and rejuvenation of our cities, nation states, and urban networks. Really, Catherine, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a um, very inspiring keynote, uh, to be honest. I think you, you managed to do what um, many of us who work on, on these topics rarely manage to do, which is bridging the local and the global level so efficiently and, and, and showing us um, the, 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 the complexities of the relationship, but also some, some avenues for, for reinforcing the role of cities in their, in their global uh, role. I found very suggesting your 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 idea on 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 how states are increasingly pursuing uh, traditional methods of security based on national goals, national interests, and national tools for projecting power. Whereas cities are probably the most promising area where human security aspects can flourish, where human security aspects can be uh, promoted, and where these aspects need to be defended as well. The key question remains, of course, how we will build an architecture yeah. mm -hmm. which is suitable for cities and which is suitable for the purposes that cities represent. But I think that you nailed it in, 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 the, in, the, in the keynote on, on, on the many topics that will be discussed uh, right after now. So from our side, let us thank you very much for, for your keynote. And then I suggest that we move to the uh, round table immediately taking place now with the different speakers that have also agreed to participate, Christian, Henry, Paul, and Lorenzo, but Agustí Fernández de Lozada, our director of the Global Cities Program, will make the formal introduction. Thank you very much.
Well, uh, good evening. Um, let's, uh, let's start this uh, second part of this, of this seminar uh, with this panel conversation uh, uh, that will uh, build in this inspiring uh, keynote that was provided by, by Catherine Kluver, uh, uh, to whom I really uh, thank uh, uh, for the, the insight that, that, that she provided that I think are going to be uh, relevant for, for our conversation to, to deepen uh, on the various uh, subjects that have been highlighted uh, during her keynote. I want also to thank uh, uh, the panelists uh, that are uh, with me on the table or online, uh, because one, we have one of the panelists uh, online uh, uh, that will be uh, uh, entering, intervening from uh, Canada, uh, from Montreal. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, I suppose. Um, we have with us uh, Christiane Heinemann. Uh, she is a uh, fellow, visiting fellow uh, at the German uh, uh, Marshall Fund. Uh, let me take my notes uh, uh, to be more comfortable. Um, we also have uh, online Henri Paul uh, Normandin, uh, uh, former uh, ambassador of Canada uh, uh, in the UN, uh, and also former director of international relations uh, of the city uh, of Montreal. Uh, uh, Henri Paul, plaisir. C'est un plaisir de vous avoir uh, uh, ici uh, avec nous, uh, même en distance. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have also uh, Lorenzo Kilgrim Gandhi, Gandhi, Grandi, director of the City Diplomacy Lab uh, and lecturer in City Diplomacy at uh, Columbia Undergraduate uh, Global Engagement uh, in Paris, based in, in Paris with also uh, an experience uh, uh, in the city of Milan, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, so a very, also a very concrete experience in, in, city, in city diplomacy. Uh, our conversation will consist in three rounds of questions. Uh, uh, I've agreed with our panelists uh, uh, and I've shared with them uh, uh, um, some questions, uh, one, some, uh, some will be specific, the other one will be the, the, the same for uh, the three of them, uh, with the idea of deepening in, the, in this issue. I will give them a maximum of five minutes to uh, uh, answer answering this, uh, these questions, so I will try to be strict with uh, 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 the use uh, of time. And the idea is to focus, and the idea is to deepen, and the idea is to build on this urban dimension that uh, 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 Catherine Kluber, uh, urban dimension of the conflict that Catherine uh, uh, Kluber has uh, uh, elaborated on. Um, I think we all agree uh, uh, that cities have become targets uh, 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 by inviting forces, not only in Ukraine, in all contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary wars. Uh, uh, they are targets because they concentrate economic, political power, they concentrate key infrastructures, they concentrate scientific and technological resources, they concentrate information. They, they are key places of identity, key places of visibility of uh, their nations. Uh, but not only cities uh, are targeted, uh, as Catherine has uh, already explained, also mayors uh, in Ukraine have been threatened uh, uh, mayors and local leaders have been threatened uh, uh, to, undermine, uh, to undermine, in a certain manner, local resistance. Uh, so cities have been targeted, local leaders, mayors have been kidnapped uh, to undermine their capacity to resist. But cities uh, are also welcoming displaced persons, refugees, and cities are challenging or are, have been challenged uh, uh, to the capacity to, to integrate, to, to provide these persons with uh, social and health care, to provide children with education, to provide jobs uh, if the war uh, persists and the situation of these persons uh, uh, remains uh, uh, um, uh, in a vulnerable uh, uh, um, uh, context uh, during months or years. Uh. 
um, cities and city networks are making an effort to promote peace. Uh, here again, the idea of city diplomacy is uh, key, are advocating for a rapid resolution, and I think Laia Bonet has been very clear uh, on this regard, for a rapid resolution uh, of, the, of, the, of the conflict. I also pose the question, are cities going to be able to work uh, uh, on reconciliation? Uh, we have seen also this issue of cities freezing or even uh, breaking their relationships with, uh, uh, with Russian cities. Uh, uh, during the Cold War, uh, cities and local governments played a, a key role uh, for reconciliation between the two blocs. So I think this is also an, a, a relevant idea to keep in mind. And last but not least, cities will play a crucial role in reconstruction. Uh, the point here is, and we will see it, especially through uh, uh, the intervention of uh, Henri Paul Normandin, uh, um, the point is, are cities playing a role in the definition and the design of this reconstruction? Uh, I think here, city diplomacy is also a, a relevant tool. In this context, and against this backdrop of profound uh, geopolit uh, geopolitical challenges uh, and threats, my first question to the three panelists. How can city diplomacy strengthen local responses to conflict and war in these different urban dimensions? Uh, and if you agree, Lorenzo, we will begin with you. Thank you very much, Agusti, for this uh, very interesting uh, invitation. Very happy to be here with you. And uh, um, I would like to offer my insight, which is somehow uh, aimed at systematizing the different challenges and how cities would like uh, to respond. Well, first, we can identify uh, uh, both bilateral and multilateral city diplomacy response by cities that are located, like luckily it's our case, in countries in peace. So this is basically what is happening in most European networks. They are exchanging best practices uh, in order to uh, cope with uh, the different consequences, direct consequences of the conflict on the local uh, communities, starting from the arrival, of course, of uh, important uh, numbers of uh, ra uh, refugees from um, uh, Ukraine. Uh, in general terms, also developing a common voice as much as possible, uh, an advocacy for peace, asking for the end of war and identifying a very specific uh, uh, vision of the conflict in course, where there is uh, uh, actually one country that has been attacked and there is a, a country which is attacking. This is quite clear in cities in Europe and in the Western world. But I would like to point out that many other regions in, in, uh, in the rest of the world, that this has been said previously, do not necessarily agree to this kind of positioning, do not necessarily agree to this kind of advocacy, and are not committed, and are not committing, and are not likely to commit in the short term to denouncing uh, the invasion and calling, like in the, uh, in the document, the call for Mariupol to uh, enforce uh, limitations in trade to uh, fight the capacity of Russia to uh, implement the war. Then we have the cities in the different, perfect different situation, the cities in war, cities in, in Ukraine currently suffering from this uh, attack by Russia. And that, what they're doing, it's, it's quite interesting because when a, Russia, when, when a war happened, there is a very difficult situation for local leaders, both in terms of uh, keeping the local governance active, keeping their, their role active and managing a territory which is undergoing such a difficult situation. And second point, make sure that what is happening on the ground is communicated and that the conflict stays on the discussion on the public, international public opinion. So for that, it is definitely vital that there is an interest of their peers of cities in Europe and other parts of the world to interact and have give visibility, exchange, create common uh, initiative with them. This is definitely vital. The war stays on the international agenda thanks to this capacity of cities to connect. And this is the third dimension. So how this uh, 
citizen peace and citizen war uh, interact? Well, the solidarity, immediate solidarity, just likely it happens at national level, also happens in uh, uh, some national levels, sometimes in a little uh, coordinated way. We have seen that there is, in fact, a, a lot of different uh, canals that have been uh, created, the bridges, and, and this is positive because it talks about the interest of uh, uh, networks and groups of cities, formal and informal, to help, but there is little coordination, which is another top topic, uh, recurring topic of city diplomacy. So it probably could be done a little more effective. It was truly centralized, and we have three or four big attempts to centralize the things, but none is actually succeeding for now. <laughs> and then there is a big issue of reconstruction, and I will close with that. Uh, once again, reconstruction is something where the role of cities in peace and in war will be vital because they have to run the services that uh, uh, clearly define the well-being in the broader sense of the term of citizens. And for that, it will be useful to count on the expertise of their peers. Once again, a very coordinated action would be needed. For now, we don't have this. Hopefully, it will happen. Thank you. Thank you, Lorenzo. Now we will continue with uh, Christiane Heinemann. So over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I'm very happy to contribute to this very interesting and uh, current discussion. So yeah, I uh, will, I can directly add to what Lorenzo said and, uh, but I would like to point out a positive view. <laughs> I mean, Lorenzo mentioned that not the whole world, not everywhere the local level is involved, but still we have seen that the local level has provided so much for Ukraine, Ukrainian cities and for Ukrainian citizens inside and outside of Ukraine. And um, so I would like to highlight all these different actions that are already going on and how the local level is important to respond to the war and to re receive refugees. On the one hand, on the local level, but also the city-to-city -city relationships and the transnational level with city networks and the exchange there, but also common statements that are made. And I would like to start with the local level because, I mean, we saw so much solidarity when the war started and we still see it throughout Europe, receiving refugees, like especially in Poland, in Moldova, also in Germany. And it's mainly yeah, cities that are uh, providing um, everything that people need for their reception, like volunteers that provided accommodation, and um, all the first emergency uh, issues were mainly by civil society, NGOs on the local level um, provided. And of course, this was um, at the beginning very important, especially the volunteers and the civil society associations. And um, still, I mean, now we were all or in the beginning, we were all shocked about the Russian attack and there was huge solidarity, but we also need to keep up and remain and hold up this uh, type of solidarity. And I think also there, the local level is very important also for awareness raising campaigns right now and to also um, yeah, find the legitimation <coughs> for all the efforts that are made on uh, the national and international level and all the effects it has for the citizens like recession, energy crisis, etc. All the effects that the sanctions on Russia have and yeah, still we need civil society and the citizens also to receive uh, the refugees. And I mean, now 
coming to the next step, city to city relations. Also here, the response is um, huge already and has been huge in, on the one hand, um, distributing and receiving refugees. I mean, and there uh, many cities bu built up on already existing relationships. Like um, just to give one example, um, my city Munich is a partner city of Kiev. And right in the beginning, Munich was very fast, very effective to uh, find bilateral solutions to send donations to Kiev and to cities to Ukraine and also uh, to uh, mobilize the civil society, pre-existent um, volunteers that were working with refugees to provide also volunteers to welcome the refugees to find accommodation and so on. And this is, as I said, there are existing um, structures we can build on, on the one hand, like town training, city networks, all these uh, kind of relationships that are already existing, that uh, make help very effective, also delivering supplies, etc., like sanitary products and so on to Ukraine. So not only for refugees, but also for those that citizens of Ukraine that are still in the war. And then, of course, on the transnational uh, level, city diplomacy and advocacy statements. I mean, some were already mentioned, like the <coughs> Mariupol call, but there is also, for example, the um, UCLG statement on the attack on Ukraine, uh, condemning the attack and um, committing local governments to facilitate peace and democracy. There was the call to release the Ukrainian mayors, for example, also from UCLG. Intercultural cities had a declaration um, on solidarity with Ukraine for refugee reception and um, supporting those cities um, who receive refugees. Then, yeah, the joint call from Mariupol, which was signed by 300 mayors. And I mean, especially, of course, uh, European um, city networks are really active, but you also see um, global ones are also very active in these uh, city diplomacy uh, statements, calls, etc. And I mean, what I would also like to ask um, our participants here, so what you think about the effectiveness of these statements and calls and also like uh, these uh, actions like Laia Bonet talked about to cancel also existing relations with um, Russian uh, cities. So. What are the effects? How effective are they? That, yeah, I would also like to ask my colleagues here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Quite relevant question. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how to how to address it. Okay. Last but not least, to conclude this uh, first uh, round of questions, uh, uh, the floor uh, is yours, uh, Henri Paul. I suppose you can hear us. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Good, ev good evening, everyone. Very nice to join you uh, tonight, although I would have much preferred to join you in person. Uh, but, uh, but here we are. And uh, thank you to Augusti and Sidon for organizing this very timely event. I think it's a very good opportunity for us to have this, uh, this uh, useful conversation. So uh, in terms of city diplomacy and local responses, uh, I, I would uh, I would sort of categorize the responses that we have seen by by cities by foreign cities that is not I'm not talking here about Ukrainian cities. I would see three types of uh, local responses that we have seen and that we're we're likely to continue to see. One is has to do with people. Uh, the second one is political, and the third one has to do with uh, with assistance. On the people front. 
Uh, obviously, the main response of, of, uh, of cities internationally has been the welcoming of refugees. Uh, I don't need to belabor that point. I think it's pretty, uh, pretty obvious. And I raise my hat to all those cities who welcome refugees by, by the tens of thousands. On the political front, of course, we have seen uh, cities make political statements, make political gestures. Uh, it's been alluded to by other speakers uh, a little earlier in terms of, uh, you know, freezing relations with Russian cities, uh, raising the Ukrainian flag on City Hall, things of this, uh, things of this nature. So we have seen a political reaction by uh, cities. Very briefly to address to address uh, Christian's uh, questions, how, how question how effective are these? I think that these statements have to be made. These political statements, uh, in various ways, have to be ma made. But um, I, I doubt that they are game changers. Of course, in this uh, in this uh, situation, just to put things in perspective, in terms of assistance. Uh, we have seen already some direct assistance, material, financial, and so on. And this is likely to continue as we approach, hopefully, the phase of uh, recovery and reconstruction in Ukraine. Uh, and we will address that a little later in the conversation. Uh, the last point I would might like to make uh, at this point in time is back to people. I was going to raise an orange light here. Because many cities, uh, understandably so, have been supporting uh, the diaspora uh, in their own city. And that here we are thinking, of course, uh, mainly of the Ukrainian diaspora. So it's perfectly legitimate, perfectly understandable. The Ukrainian diaspora in our cities uh, needs some support. But the point I was going to make uh, has partly been made by the deputy mayor already we have in many of our cities we have a ukrainian diaspora but we also have a russian diaspora uh, as a footnote by way by way of information the second largest ukrainian diaspora in the world after russia happens to be in canada we have 1.4 million people of ukrainian descent in canada but we also have people of Russian descent in Canada and, of course, particularly in our cities. And uh, these people are our citizens as well. And despite the fact that people have different political views on what's happening in, in Ukraine, we have to be very careful not to ostracize uh, the Russian diaspora in our cities. And we have also, in a way, to take care of them. And I think, again, the deputy mayor made a very valuable point uh, there, because as cities, we have also to encourage, you know, social inclusion, the urban, the, the, the social fabric, living together and all of this. So I just want to raise this orange flag there that as we work on the people's side with our Ukrainian diaspora, we cannot overlook our Russian diaspora. It's a delicate situation, it's a complex situation, but let, let us not lose sight of this, uh, this challenge that we have in our own uh, cities. So I will leave it at that for, for the moment. Okay, thanks. Thanks, uh, Paul. Um, I really appreciate this last comment uh, because I, I think you, you, you highlight a, a, a relevant issue that it will be uh, uh, necessary to, to tackle and, and to reflect a little bit on, 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 on it, uh, how to take care also uh, of this Russian uh, uh, diaspora. Uh. Um, let's go for uh, the second round of uh, questions here. I will pose specific questions to all the, the, the panelists. I will start now with uh, Christian Heinemann. Um, since the conflict started, uh, uh, I think it has been already mentioned here, uh, almost six million uh, 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 refugees, more than seven million displaced people uh, internally in, uh, uh, in uh, Ukraine. How is this shaping? Uh, how is this shaping European cities? How is this shaping uh, European cities' relationships? Uh, what are uh, cities? How are cities cooperating to address this uh, uh, crucial challenge? 
and the role of city networks, of course. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think uh, especially, well, here also city networks um, are very important in the reception of refugees. I mean, we saw that in the Polish Association of Cities, we see that also in Germany, and also the connection to the Association of Ukrainian Cities. So they're the national City networks are on the one hand very, um, very important, but of course also the transnational city networks. And I think especially in this area of migration and integration, this is also a window of opportunity to work more together throughout Europe and also to be more inclusive because um, formally in the for example, during the crisis of the common European asylum system when we uh, received the Afghans and Syrian refugees, there was always a divide already within Europe. You know? On the one hand, the southern European countries that received uh, refugees. On the other hand, Western um, European cities. And then the Eastern European cities that did not receive refugees. And so, um, yeah, it was difficult um, due to the different stances also and the different situation the nation states were in and the different uh, political ideologies. And now for the first time or in this, uh, in this area of migration and integration, for example, but also condemning the Russian attack, Europe is really united now and we also see that this uh, changes the the figures that are active in city networks for example there are they especially mayors for example from prague or also from warsaw are very active now in this area of migration and integration and um, so also to involve the cities of uh, Eastern <coughs> Europe more in this area can be also a midterm or long term a good opportunity also to work uh, together on uh, other topics, for example. And I mean, they are showing city networks, um, national ones, regional ones, international, transnational ones. They show together a commitment to peace, say the port and uh, maintain the infrastructure in Ukraine by donations, uh, uh, collecting funds, etc., and uh, humanitarian delivery of supplies. But of course, the cities also um, receive refugees. They provide uh, all kinds of accommodation, for example, workforce integration, education, qualification, etc. And they build direct bridges between Ukrainian cities and cities abroad. So there is a lot that's already going on. And um, just to uh, <laughs> refer to the Russian diaspora, as uh, this was mentioned before, I think, for example, in my home country, in Germany, the Russian-speaking people are very involved and also engaged in receiving Ukrainians and Ukrainian refugees providing translation, consultation, information, etc. So, um, yeah, they are in Germany at least also a important source to receive the refugees. And there are different efforts of uh, European networks right now facilitating also direct bilateral ways of cooperation between Ukrainian cities and cities abroad. For example, there is uh, the task force of the Council of European Municipalities and Regions and uh, the info support hub of the committee of the regions, for example, and the cities for cities platform. And their Ukrainian cities can um, 
in this platform, um, yeah, make statements on the demands, on the situation they are in, and other cities abroad can see what does this city need, what can we provide them, and um, through this already existing city-to-city uh, -city partnerships in the networks, this can be delivered and it can be delivered really quite fast and effective. And yeah, there you see that this, uh, this way of exchange, exchange on information, know-how also in the receiving cities, but also providing support, infrastructure, supplies uh, to Ukraine. That works very well on a city-to-city -city basis. And it's, as I said, mainly, but not only the European uh, city networks. Also, for example, Metropolis is uh, working on bringing experts together on the topic, for example, in their pre-conference program of the Metropolis Conference in September. And also Welcoming America is giving information on community sponsorship to support um, cities that would like to receive or uh, are open to receive Ukrainian refugees. So I think the role of city networks is on the one hand that they are facilitators for um, with regards to contacts, delivery of supply, know-how, peer learning, etc., And uh, yeah, I mean, they also have these common political statements, but I think what the next step would be and what should happen next is to move from this bilateral help on demand to a more strategic and organized, less fragmented way to work together on all these issues of refugee reception, but also reconstruction of Ukrainian cities. So, thank you. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Let me go back to, to Henri Paul. Um, for uh, the second question, when it comes to reconstruction, um, how will the municipalist movement be able to make a contribution? Um, what is the potential and what uh, are the challenges? How to engage or involve the munic municipal movement in, in this reconstruction? Of course, it's, it's a little early to talk about this, but it is not too early because one day recovery and reconstruction will come. And uh, I think that uh, the municipalist movement or foreign cities definitely can play a useful role. But, but, but. There are many traps and risks, and I would like to highlight a number of them. But first of all, let's look at the bigger picture, uh, cities aside for a moment. We all know that reconstruction of Ukraine will be a huge challenge. It will be a multi-donor, multi-sector undertaking. Hence, the related challenge, huge challenge of aid coordination. There will be so many players, so many decision-making levels, information flows that will be confused at times, competing political bureaucracies coming together, trying to make things happen. So the coordination amongst donors on the one hand, and maybe even more importantly, the coordination between donors and the host country, Ukraine, will be a challenge. And even if people had the best of intentions, it is not going to be simple. I've lived it myself in various circumstances, including it was not a post-war situation, it was a post-natural disaster situation, but still, I've lived it on the ground in Haiti after the earthquake where all the donors came in and the Bill Clintons of this world and uh, the multilateral donors and, and, and national governments and so on. Everybody tried to get their act together, but it was a huge challenge. This being said, one asset maybe that we will have in the case of Ukraine, which is often absent 
in other reconstruction situations is that the, the state of Ukraine, the government of Ukraine, uh, has some capability. I mean, Ukraine is not, uh, is not a, uh, a weak state. It's not a failed state. It has its, its failures as well, including corruption. But it is, by and large, a capable government, which has been weakened to some extent, of course, by the war. But we're not dealing here in a situation where, where, where we have a weak or a, a, or, or a, a failed, uh, failed state. So that would be an asset. But even within that context. So let's now look. This is the overall context. But let us, let us now look at cities in this context. And uh, I've identified five big questions or challenges for foreign cities as they try to make a useful contribution. The first, and probably the most immediate, is how will cities insert themselves in this bigger donor coordination environment? How will they be able to influence the decisions or be part of the decisions as well as the implementation? So that is the very first question. A second question related to that and I'm sorry to use the, uh, the, uh, the, the old expression, but I think it is still valid. Cities will have to fight to have their seat or their seats at the table. It is not, and, and take it from a former national diplomat who was also an urban diplomat, it is not the natural instinct of, of national governments to invite, states at the, uh, to invite cities at the table. So cities will have to fight their way in uh, those tables with donor coordination and the related issue will be who will represent them. Obviously it cannot be individual cities. It cannot be Barcelona, Los Angeles, Montreal, Berlin, and so on. Cities will have to be represented somehow, presumably by city networks, global networks, uh, EU networks. And that will be a little bit of a challenge in and out, in it by itself. So that's the second question who will be, at the table representing cities. Third question and, and challenge, the urban agenda of reconstruction, what will it look like? Here I have to say that we're not off with a bad start. At the Lugano conference just, uh, just last week actually, uh, the Ukrainian government presented its, its draft recovery plan and there are elements of urban issues into this, urban and local issues so I think I look at that. Uh, I look at that positively. However, and here, if my information is incorrect, please let me know. But unless I am mistaken, Ukrainian cities were not part of the Lugano conference, and neither were foreign cities uh, there. Uh, but again, if my information is incorrect, please let me know. I'd be I'd be happy to uh, to hear. But anyway, the point here is that. The urban agenda will have to be built in and cities, Ukrainian and foreign cities, will have to be part of that. Fourth question, obviously, considering all the needs, how will cities identify worthwhile projects that they can really deliver uh, that will be useful? So the identification of useful projects and programs will be a challenge. I'll come back with a few more comments on this in a, in a, in a few moments. And the fifth question, and a big one, will be through which channels will foreign cities want to work and which ones will be effective? We talk a lot, a lot of course, about city-to-city -city relations, bilateral relations. That is one channel. It is useful, but it is not necessarily the be-all, end-all, and it does not always work. So city-to-city -city relationship is one channel, but it's not the only one and not necessarily and not always the most effective. Maybe cities will want to work in partnership with their own national government, and this happens. Maybe also foreign cities will want to work with, with or through multilateral organizations, World Bank and so on, and UN. That is another challenge. challenge. So identifying which channel cities should be able to effectively work through is going to be a challenge by itself. So these five questions or challenges having been posed, a few other observations. What I raise here is actually the question of effectiveness 
and the capacity of cities to deliver. And here, let me make a general proposition that does not only apply to cities, it applies to international aid in peacetime or in post-war time. Good ideas and good intentions do not necessarily make for good development projects. Let me repeat this again. Good ideas and good intentions do not necessarily make for good development projects. When I was in Haiti, for instance, I saw some Canadian cities after the earthquake come and work. Some of them did it effectively. They knew what they were doing. They already had some linkages. They knew the local environment. They were successful. I've seen other Canadian cities come to work in Haiti after the earthquake. They didn't have a clue what they were doing. They had good ideas. They had good intentions, but they had no experience and really no capacity to deliver. And most importantly, they did not have the local knowledge, the understanding of the local situation and the right kinds of partnerships with, uh, with Haitian uh, partners and cities. Again, that, that general proposition goes for any type of donor, including NGOs. But I want to highlight it here, of course, in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, of cities. So cities, in a way, will have to be ambitious, but they will also have to have a lot of humility. And what will, there, what will be their value added in the reconstruction of Ukraine? One thing that will not be their big value added is money. The amounts of funds that national governments and multilateral donors will bring to the table will dwarf the funds of cities. So money is always useful, but it will not be the value added of cities. I think that the value added of cities will lie in their experience and their expertise of urban issues. And those are the hard issues like, you know, infrastructure, water, and so on. And some of the soft issues like social inclusion, living together, local democracy and participation, urban planning, those sorts of things. So cities, obviously, foreign cities have an expertise in this, but it is not sufficient. When you want to be effective in international cooperation, you need also an expertise in the delivery of cooperation and assistance. Some cities have that, but not all. So I think I can reasonably predict that a number of cities well-equipped, well-experienced will be able to do a meaningful contribution. I think that unfortunately, I'm also safe in predicting that a number of foreign cities with good ideas and good intentions will come in and they will not be able to deliver effectively for the Ukrainian people. So I think that again, I come back to this, this point, foreign cities will need to have ambition they will have to be very strategic, but they will also have to be humble and they will have to think through what they need to be effective. And honestly, answering all these five questions is not going to be a, uh, a, uh, a simple task. So that's what I wanted to share with you on the issue of, uh, of uh, reconstruction. Thanks, uh, Harry Paul. This is a, a wonderful, a, a brilliant roadmap for for involving cities in in in, in the process of reconstruction. So, so thanks a lot. I think it's really valuable, um, Lorenzo. Um, in a context of uh, or in an ecosystem that is marked by dispersion, right? an ecosystem of city networks that is marked by dispersion, is it possible to channel a, a collective response? Uh, to the conflict, or on the contrary, will a multiplicity of responsible uh, of responses uh, impose itself on the international uh, uh, scenario, conducting to a less effective uh, um, response or a less effective uh, 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 um, scenario? Thank you, Agusti. I think this question uh, resonates with uh, the question from uh, Christian about uh, how effective is all of that. And that's definitely a very important question. Uh, well, unfortunately, I have seen, uh, experienced uh, 
especially through my city diplomacy related activities in Africa. I've done four different events in, over the last uh, month uh, in Africa and I experienced this uh, uh, diversity of addressing such an important issue in a different geographical context. So yes, definitely I restate there is a, a sort of uh, diversity of reaction to, to this goal. Uh, I would say in a nutshell that uh, uh, the Ukrainian uh, conflict is definitely highlighting once uh, more the strengths and weaknesses of uh, city diplomacy itself. So the strengths, uh, it is a swift, it is flexible, it is able to uh, implement concrete actions and bring them on the ground. It is able to reach uh, the international public opinion. It is able to speak to uh, nation governments and international organizations and have their voice heard. But then, of course, there is this uh, weakness uh, because on one side, even when we all agree the direction we have to take, and this means especially the Western cities, uh, well, there is a, a lack of coordination once again with uh, those uh, city networks, there are, uh, there are more than 300 uh, international city networks and uh, with uh, basically many of them sharing uh, the same purposes. And, and this also implies that when uh, there is some sort of competition, there is also a lack of coordination. Unfortunately, we are seeing that uh, uh, once again. So to, to better answer to, to this question, taking in consideration this uh, uh, sort of uh, um, pr proof of the efficacy of, of uh, city diplomacy in this difficult situation, I would say, well, if the goal was to change the course of the war, the city diplomacy is totally useless. Unfortunately, we, we, all, we are all aware that it's unlikely for the president of the Russian Federation to stop attacking because uh, cities said so, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, re regardless of this uh, uh, point, it is quite effective in two other dimensions. Uh, first of all, to express solidarity towards both cities in Ukraine and uh, citizens, Ukrainian citizens, both in Ukraine and uh, traveling, uh, fleeing the war in, uh, as asylum seekers, as refugees in, in cities. And finally, this uh, uh, capacity of cities to go in on the international stage and present their vision. So city diplomacy, it's a field that is resonating even more. And this opens up to interesting developments that we probably address in the last uh, uh, final question. Um, there is uh, two points that I would like to address uh, in, in this regards uh, that pertains the two obstacles that I mentioned before, this idea of uh, separation between the priorities regarding this war. Uh, with uh, uh, actually, I will see you develop this very interesting approach of blocks that I think it's definitely uh, uh, what we are experiencing now, and it's likely to be uh, useful also in future <coughs> crises unrelated to this uh, current one. Well, we have uh, definitely a block of uh, cities supporting the regime of uh, and the war, and that's uh, um, what happens in Russia. So there is little. Uh, to say in these regards. The second group, which is much bigger, is, is all those cities that parallel their own national government in, in a position of limited engagement uh, uh, or lack of condemnation of uh, this war, sometimes even coupled with some sort of criticism towards Western and particular European cities that appear to be extremely sensible when a war happens uh, in their own continent and not that sensible and not that uh, active when a similar war happened or is even happening right now in other continents. And you have this sort of accusation of double standards that have some ground. Uh, the two points, the one of uh, uh, cities not condemning uh, an event which is clearly a violation of international law and human rights, and the second point of uh, sort of uh, 
resentment and disinterest towards uh, this kind of uh, advocacy is in fact linked to the uh, concept itself of city diplomacy. When can we talk about city diplomacy when we cannot? <coughs> This is definitely related to the level of democracy and decentralization, and then applies up until the uh, level of ap application of uh, um, the uh, concept of um, uh, um, subsidiarity. Sorry, subsidiarity. That's, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the end point that uh, city diplomacy is definitely looking for. So we live in a, in a world where city diplomacy is running is running fast but only for a part of the world we have to take care also of the rest of the world and identify possibilities for city diplomacy to be truly global and to go beyond the territorial fractures even inside national governments the national boundaries sorry where we see city diplomacy being solidly in the hands of uh, important uh, progressive well-connected cities and not so much in cities that are uh, smaller size and with uh, less connection of all kinds with uh, foreign actors. Thank you, thank you, Lorenzo. Um, we will enter now the third round and the last question I will pose uh, my colleagues. Um, I will ask you, we, we are running out of time completely out of time, so we, we decided to extend a little bit uh, our seminar uh, to give also the opportunity to, to, to share the floor with, uh, with the audience. Uh, and, and I would also like the, to give the opportunity to, to Catherine Kluver to, to get back uh, to the many ideas that have uh, uh, raised during, during the, the, the conversation. Uh, but let me go to the third question because I, I think it's a, it's a very relevant one. Uh, I will ask uh, uh, my colleagues to be brief and concise uh, answering these questions. I, I would give you only one minute, but I, I think it's going to be a bit difficult, but uh, do your best, please. Um, Henri Paul, um, how is city diplomacy changing and evolving in this new era of conflict? Uh, are there going to be relevant changes uh, uh, in, in the way that uh, uh, cities are operating in the, in the international scenario? Of course, we will have to see over time. But uh, the one thing that I think we have to bear in mind is that uh, at the risk of being provocative, I think that so far cities have limited experience with dealing with conflict. I'm talking about foreign cities here, of course, of course not cities uh, of countries where there is conflict, but foreign cities, the municipalist movement, we have limited experience in dealing with conflict and everything that comes with it. Uh, look at the, the conflicts and wars in the world today, beyond Ukraine, uh, we are not all that active. This being said, I think that with the conflict, uh, the war in Ukraine, cities, particularly North American and, and European cities, of course, uh, I should have mentioned European cities first, will acquire experience that would be useful and i hope that this experience would be useful not only in addressing ukraine's challenges and needs but also over time so that cities can also look after other conflicts in the world which we tend a little bit to overlook in all modesty last point i would want to make the big geopolitical picture uh, I think uh, Lorenzo just made the point that, uh, in his own words, that, you know, cities are not necessarily going to change the course of events of geopolitical tensions uh, and challenges. So if the value added of cities is, is not so much changing the major course of geopolitical events, what will it be? I think in due course, I think, and Agusti, you addressed it. You addressed that issue in a, in an op-ed you wrote in El Pais uh, recently. I think that foreign cities will have to bear in mind that in a post-war situation, we may well have a role to play to reconstruct some of those bridges. So, for instance, a number of cities are suspending their links with Russia. It's a course of action, perfectly understandable, but hopefully these links are suspended 
and not necessarily definitely canceled because in due course, we will have to reconstruct some bridges uh, elsewhere. And there again, cities like civil society may have to play a role that sometimes will be difficult for the national governments to play. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Henri Paul Lorenzo. I will be very quick. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, I would just like to point out that uh, this is a very timely and interesting uh, initiative. And I think there will be other that uh, will follow. We are basically starting in the broad field of uh, city diplomacy, which includes uh, research centers, uh, 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 of course, municipalities, uh, other actors, foundations, uh, universities, and so on. This is a global discussion that uh, this crisis has uh, produced in order to discuss those ele elephants in the room of city diplomacy that I mentioned before, this dispersion, duplication, uh, diversity, uh, the definition itself of city diplomacy, when can be applied to non-democratic, non-decentralized non country. So basically, I think uh, this is an opportunity to create coherence and uh, it is uh, very timely. If we want uh, for city diplomacy to put on the international table the real added value of this practice, which is linked to the identity itself of the city, which is not only the oldest uh, political institution, but more importantly, the closest political institution, so closest to the feelings, the needs, even the fears, the interests, and the values of citizens, well, this has to be included inside of the international relations realms throughout a methodology that has to be developed in a broader possible way. I think it's, uh, it's important that we are now doing this effort to reconnect the practice and the theory and hopefully identify a way to make uh, the use of city diplomacy in all crises that have a human security component. Fantastic, thanks, Christiana. Thank you, so I try to be as brief as possible. Um, well, I mean, we still have to see how city diplomacy will change during this crisis and also during the war in Ukraine. And uh, well, so let me rather formulate some hopes or wishes I would have. So on the one hand, I mean, I think right now there is the opportunity for more inclusion in transnational city networks, for example, to um, yeah, integrate different geographic regions, but also different uh, profiles of municipalities, also smaller ones or metropolitan areas, because everybody is facing the same issue. So we all are affected by the recession, by an energy crisis, by uh, some more or less refugee reception, by providing humanitarian aid, showing uh, solidarity and uh, keep up also the democratic spirit throughout Europe, but also um, the globe. And I would hope for transnational city networks that uh, they would rather work together on these issues instead of uh, being competitive with each other, which sometimes happens. And I would hope that uh, there is an end of uh, the silo thinking, yeah? But I think we need comprehensive approaches for all these issues and we have to think different issues together. I mean, for example, um, Eurocities had a conference together with Ukrainian cities and were, they were thinking about how to maintain infrastructure or reconstruct um, the Ukrainian cities. And they, they also included different ideas of urban and rural development, of um, energy supply and new methods of development. And well, I would also hope that this uh, happens also for migration, migrant integration, to think it together with housing shortages that are especially, um, yeah, 
difficult in uh, metropolitan areas, but also the economic development recession, and on the other hand, labor market integration of refugees and immigrants, to think about urban and rural development together with strengthening democracy and social cohesion and humanitarian aid. And I mean uh, my last statement, <laughs> um, as uh, Henri said, yeah, I mean, a good idea is not necessarily a good project or a good action, but I mean, uh, what cities and what Henri also said, I mean, cities can really contribute by sharing their experience of the local level and uh, by peer learning, by sharing know-how and work together for peer learning and advocacy. Thank you, Christiane. Um, having hope uh, and hopes are always uh, uh, very relevant. Uh, it's, it's really important. Um, we, uh, I'm going to, 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 to give you audience the floor. Huh? So um, uh, if you have questions, if you have reflections uh, to share with the, with the panelists, uh, to share with uh, uh, Catherine uh, uh, with regards to uh, her uh, um, uh, keynote, now uh, the turn is yours. Please present yourself. Hi, I'm Alexandra. Um, thank you very much for this um, extensive uh, knowledge you shared with us all. Um, I have a question regarding uh, what you all mentioned about like how cities are cutting or frozen ties with uh, their city counterparts in Russia. Um, my question is like kind of fragmented multi-municipalism run the risk of stop being part of the solution once the reconstruction come, um, comes or once the peace processes come? Maybe, yeah, Arta. We take two or three questions and then... Hi, I'm Marta Galzeran. Um, I'm a research fellow here at CIDOP at the Global Cities Program as well. Um, so my question, there was... through. Well, first of all, thank you very much for all the like interventions, very inspiring. But um, when, whenever we talk about city diplomacy, we always come to this idea of a fragmented ecosystem, right? And uh, after much thinking, um, sometimes I'm wondering, and, and so what if it's fragmented? Because you, you were just mentioning before, C40 has, hasn't done any statement yet, but C40 deals with climate change. Does C40 need to do that? And then we can think, yes, because in other occasions they have done that, so it's a political sensitive issue. But yes, we have 300 uh, city networks, but not all of them perhaps need to, to um, find common um, ground for, for acting uh, together, right? Um, so, Augusti, you were just asking, I think, Lorenzo, uh, is it possible to uh, deliver a collective response uh, to the challenge? My question is, do we need that? We, we, do we need a, a collective response from, from the international municipalism? And if we need that, who will represent that collective voice? Because we have a, a problem here, because not we don't have a UN of cities, even if you, UCLG claims that is that space, but it is not that space. We know that. So um, I just want to know a bit more about uh, your thoughts on that. Final question there. Thank you very much. I think it, the, the idea of the, the problem with cities and what happens to civilians is it, an awful problem. And has been since the time Euripides wrote the Trojan War, passing through the wars of religion, General Sherman marching through Georgia and South Carolina, to yet the Allies bombing of Japan and Germany. Uh, it's, it's still going on now, but what I think was was missing, especially what Miss Miss uh, Kluver mentioned, uh, um, but again, it seems to me that. Putin is being made of as the boogeyman, if not a cartoon villain. And he didn't happen in a vacuum. And what is, I don't know, 
it seems to me you cannot talk about Ukraine and Russia without mentioning the name George Kennan, who was the architect of the Truman Doctrine, of the containment against communism. He pleaded with the authorities in the United States. There was no, no non-Russian ever lived who knew the Russians as well as George Kennan did. He had lived there since the 1920s. He spoke Russian fluently. And he pleaded with the American authorities not to take advantage of, Ru advantage of Russia when she's down, because she's down now, but she won't be down forever, because she has such tremendous natural resources. And so what has happened is that um, this is a, a, the tragedy of, of Ukraine cannot be talked, of, talked about in a vacuum. And the West bears responsibility for, or for provoking Putin, who is an, an awful person and an autocrat, and I wouldn't want to, to live in Russia. But Russia is a nuclear power. They have nuclear weapons. And they were talking about the six weeks ago, two months ago, it being the, uh, 1938. Well, the real analogy is 1914, where people, where nations effectively slept, sleepwalked into a terrible war. And now the, the continual provoking of Putin could have these terrible, disastrous consequences of even a nuclear war. And I don't see how you can talk about this without with mentioning the, the boogeyman nature of, of uh, Putin without talking about what happened before. Thank you. Um, one last question here, and we will go back to, to the panel. Hello, well, this is more like sort of a, re a reflection. Uh, my name is Viviana Wu, and in fact, um, I am a member of the Youth Caucus at UCLG, and this is a topic we've been kind of uh, thinking for me personally. And I completely agree with the, um, um, the proposition made by um, Mr. Henry Ball, good ideas and good intentions do not necessarily make for good development projects. But also I think that like this comes from the um, current uh, form of development, which is seen from uh, people from other um, places going, for example, for instance, to Africa and trying to build up like some development projects. So like I feel that we are kind of seeing the potential of uh, city diplomacy and the role of uh, municipalism in the reconstruction from this point of view, more than um, the, like, the possibility that can emerge from uh, um, focus groups, like, um, like really focused on building the capacity of the officials and the, and the um, um, politicians at the local level in Ukraine and in other countries, because I may be wrong, I'm not an expert in this topic, I'm just like um, jumping in, um, but local level do not receive and do not have like a broad perspective on what peace or or like from security studies are they don't really know what is reconstruction they they've never t taught uh, about this um and i don't know if um municipalism could make like a strong uh contribution by providing um the necessary tools for effective training um from from the point of view of uh um, um, sorry, um, well, well, from different points, points of view, yes, uh, uh, reconstruction, but also um, conflict management, like what are they doing right now? How are they managing the, like, the internal conflicts that may be arising from um, the, the state of social um, turbulence and et cetera, no? Like I think that the municipal movement can play a big role in uh, um, generating this resilience and this uh, capacity to act. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Well, I give back the floor to, to, to the panel. Uh, I will start. Christiane, you want to, to say something, to add something to, to the questions? Um, well, I would uh, like to respond on the fragmentation issue of cities and city networks. Well, I mean, uh, you ask if it is a problem or if it is not a problem. I think it depends. I mean, on the one hand, it's... Uh, 
it's a good thing that uh, different networks are specialized on different topics, on uh, different um, areas, for example. And there they have their expertise and are active in uh, doing what they can provide. But I think it's also sometimes um, there are a lot of different ongoing projects in different uh, transnational city networks and they do not take each other in account sometimes. And if uh, city networks or city um, diplomacy takes each other in account and they work together, like for example, the Committee of the Region, the Council of European Municipalities and Regions and Eurocities do it, they are stronger together in sharing experience, peer learning. Also, they have a stronger voice in terms of advocacy. So yeah, I mean, I see both sides. You, know, you, you need different networks for different issues, but um, it's also good to work together whenever possible. And uh, yeah, it's inefficient if everybody tries to address the same problem in his or her way. Thanks, Christiana. Lorenzo. I totally agree with uh, Christian on that point. Uh, it is uh, uh, nice to have a multiplicity of actors, but once again, uh, it's difficult to have a, a person speaking the voice of cities. And this is difficult if we uh, take into consideration how international relations work. Eventually, we will need uh, to be at the table who, who speaks for cities. So we have different candidates, but uh, there is not a solution uh, for now, um, because that would be disputed. Uh, any actor who would claim is the voice of city is not, uh, uh, will not, uh, uh, be um, <laughs> left alone by the other networks who claim also the same thing. So, um, well, uh, I would like to point uh, to, to respond to the to, uh, the point on capacity building, on training, and uh, the reconstruction. Uh, and uh, this is very true. There is a lack of uh, uh, knowledge in many actions, not only reconstruction by by municipalities who are keen to engage in this kind of activities. They they want to, but they don't necessarily have the means in terms of human resources and uh, methodologies. Uh, in the past, there have been, uh, of course, very uh, interesting example of reconstruction. I think uh, uh, about what uh, different European cities and uh, city networks have done, for example, in uh, former Yugoslavian countries, where they helped uh, their peers in rebuilding their uh, different services and uh, putting in place local governance. This has also happened in the Philippines, in Sierra Leone, and many other African countries. So this has happened in the past. Nevertheless, there is a lack. There, uh, of knowledge uh, in many countries, in many cities that would like to commit. So I think that's the role of peer-to-peer uh, uh, -peer, uh, exchange between cities, facilitated by UCLG and many other networks, uh, as well as uh, there is an important uh, responsibility for universities and uh, uh, educational centers that uh, are starting now to put their tools and to gather the, the experts to be at the service of uh, uh, the communities that need it the most. Okay, thanks, uh, Lorenzo. Uh, Eric Paul, uh, a final word? Yes, very, uh, very briefly. I'm not overly worried by uh, fragmentation. Uh, a few points. First of all, an observation. Uh, having worked both in the UN and multilateral institutions on the one side and, and then in uh, city networks and so on, I can tell you that city networks are much less politicized than the UN is. So uh, I think that that is, uh, that is uh, an asset. Secondly, I would like to echo a point that Catherine made in her, her intervention about the fact that for many cities in the global south, they, they don't want to get too much involved into this. Uh, I wrote a piece with the German Marshall Fund a few weeks ago, uh, the title of which was, Is Non-Alignment Back? So I think we have to bear in mind that a lot of uh, a lot of cities in the global south will not want to be drawn in too too much in this uh, in this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, and then I think that for the cities that feel most passionate and involved uh, in the Ukrainian um, uh, war, and particularly of course the cities in Europe and also in North America, I think that we we'll, we will have to be somewhat pragmatic. 
uh, if we cannot push uh, our agenda and our projects and etc in a certain network or in a global network well then let's be pragmatic let's push it elsewhere in another network or through another means this actually is an advantage over the UN. In the UN, it is the one place, whereas in city networks and city diplomacy, we can shop around. We have many different networks with different types of mandates. So if we cannot push something in one place, we can push it in another place or through another channel. So actually, I think that this is actually an advantage for, for city diplomacy. So I'm not saying that the situation will not have certain, will not create certain tensions within city networks. But I think that with, with a dose of wisdom, I think that we can avoid the, the trap of, uh, of fragmentation. And I think we can, uh, we can avoid the trap of, of bringing down the, uh, the, the, the uh, international municipal movement uh, on that front. Great. Thanks, Thanks uh, a lot, uh, Ari Paul. And now I invite Kathleen Kluver to Shut up. Uh, well, that is always the worst job when there's been a rich um, and vivid discussion to try to tie this all together. But um, let me just say a couple of, of basic things that I think have come through here, but I think are worth restating. Cities are not some sort of benign, uninterested actors. They're interested, um, they're self-interested. Henri Paul just said it, they're pragmatic. They have less time than any nation state. They have less bureaucracy to deal with any of these issues than any country, which is to say that, you know, again, oftentimes in many municipalities, it's the same people that are keeping the lights on that are trying to figure out how to coordinate Ukraine, uh, you know, aid to Ukraine or keeping the schools running or keeping the water on or, or whatever it is, which is to say, if they're in this fight, they're vested in it for a couple of reasons. The big question behind it is what would happen if they came for us? And they don't necessarily mean Russia. They can equally mean China. We're talking about German cities. Um, you know, Duisburg is entirely reconstructed in sort of that 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 um, new industrialized fashion with through Chinese investment. The entire um, uh, inner harbor in the city of Duisburg is run on Chinese technology. What happens if China invades Taiwan and begins to use the sort of same instruments or same basic instruments and tools to again wreak havoc on other urban re or other relations that it has, oftentimes with urban uh, uh, centers, including the ones that it's made dependent on itself through the Belt and Road Initiative. Like what elements of the Russian crisis that, that urban centers are experiencing now could come back to haunt us in some other vision. So I think enlightened urban leaders are getting ready for that sort of population. And they're again, doing it out of self-interest. I think the big question right now is, I mean, we, we landed on reconstruction, but we're so far from reconstruction you know, because we're not even at, at, a, at, a, at a possible, quote unquote, negotiated viewpoint of all of this. So right now, cities are working, um, you know, against the axis of time, but under the impression of vividness, refugees are coming, they need jobs, they need to be integrated, things need to work. Again, light schools, water, energy, everything we talked about. Um, and so those things are coming together and they're forcing the attention of cities but because cities are so pragmatic and they have problems to solve, that vividness might not remain high for long unless the problems remain vivid. And so one thing to think about is where then do the interactions of the levels, the national, the, the networks help, you know, and then, and then the advocacy part, which I find fascinating because that is most definitively new in city networks. That's, cities are asking other cities to advocate for themselves in you know either toward their national governments or in a multilateral context that's a new component and you see cities actively backing away from that birmingham was very uncomfortable i think with zaporizhia's request to lobby the british government for more munition right because those are those are pressures that are not or, or relationships that are not necessarily there in that way shape or form so the question is how do, do urban, how does urban engagement remain vivid and sticky? And again, what is the motivation of cities to do so? I completely agree with you, for instance, that it's Ukraine's cities' decisions to decide 
ultimately what their reconstruction is going to look like, which is why, you know, and Henri Paul is also right. We have to be very careful of our hubris when, you know, the 10 economists come out with a reconstruction plan for Ukraine and they say, oh, you know what they need is they need modular architecture and Singaporean style social housing. Well, you know what Singaporean style social housing comes with to maintain Singaporean style pluralism and Singaporean style racial integration is massive control, right? I don't know if Ukrainians want that. I don't know if they want that kind of level of social control in their lives. That's the only reason why sort of the design of the buildings in Singapore, which are not entirely different from Le Corbusier's designs uh, for, for common living spaces in the France of the 70s, and there it failed, and in Singapore it didn't, and it has everything to do with the social, cultural, linguistic, and uh, 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 construct and social cohesion. So absolutely, Ukrainian mayors should decide what they want, what, what I was trying to say in my talk is that cities should think about what they have on offer, that again, in experimenting and working with Ukrainian cities, cities can ultimately make them more resilient. Because this is not a do-gooder, cities aren't out there to do good. You know, they don't have time. They need to get stuff done and they need to do it in a way that's gonna ultimately service them and add to their own knowledge and their own version of urban intelligence. So again, I think this axis of time is running against urban engagement, unless, you know, there are other elements that begin to complicate this issue. So, you know, for us that think about how do we create systems around this or potentially, and I, I don't necessarily agree with the fact that we need coordinating bodies, but cr creating vividness, stickiness, and motivation for the cities that already have a quote unquote dog in the fight, I think is going to be important. Um, getting cities to understand that there are, they're answering bigger order questions about you know, again, a possible role of China. Those are those things are not unimportant either, um, and and that they don't understand themselves as proxies for other forces at play. That cities still feel self-actualized, and 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 uh, you know the fact that they have a that they have their own voice in it. But I think that means that Ukrainian mayors need to be listened to and engaged. And I think in that interface, and this is the point that I was trying to get to, I think in a benign, the perfect situation, you have urban intelligence matching national intelligence, matching foreign policy objectives, matching urban interests, such that you ultimately uh, evidence better solutions, functional solutions that then, um, you know, go to this idea of creating real human security. So the kind of things that we got wrong after World War II, the kind of things we're cataclysmically getting wrong in Aleppo, where we desperately need to stabilize Syria and the city of Aleppo because they're, you know, we'll continue to have the migrant flows we're having and the tragic stories uh, uh, across the Mediterranean, but where we have a dictator who's using who's manipulating us, who's playing with us, and, and will end up having a similar situation in Russia. And, and I'm, I'm sorry, sir, I cannot but vehemently disagree with you. I think that may have been true in George Kennan's time, but if you have a Russian federation that's violated the NATO-Russia Final Act, that's violated every piece of, of post-war nuclear control structure, and you have an, an aggressor who's overrun a free and democratic country where Ukrainians are dying on the battlefield as we sit here and speak and civilians are dying in kindergartens and schools. We cannot but, but be pacifists. That time is over. Vladimir Putin is the aggressor. Russia in this phase of the conflict cannot get a mile, cannot stand to get a mile. We must arm Ukraine, we must support Ukraine, we must defend its rights because we're still defending our, the integrity of our own definition of democracy. All right. Um, I think we all um, agree uh, on the relevance of, of city diplomacy to, to, to tackle this, this conflict, to tackle conflicts, uh, and to tackle this uh, threat. Um, I think also we all agree on the weaknesses. We all agree, especially on uh, the strengths of, of city diplomacy. We have very well identified weaknesses and strengths and the challenges uh, that we have uh, 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 to address. Um, but I also think we need more conversation. I also, I, I also think we need to deepen uh, on the various issues that have been, uh, 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 have been addressed uh, uh, during uh, this uh, conversation. So here, uh, uh, from the perspective of our global cities, 
Uh, it's our commitment to continue working on this issue because we really think it's a highly relevant issue for cities, but not only for cities. Uh, I think uh, cities play a, a, a critical role in this new global order, global reality that is emerging uh, uh, in, in a context of polarization, in a context of complexity. Yeah? And I think we need knowledge, we need ideas, we need to share, we need to deepen, we need to understand. Yeah? And this is our uh, engagement. Uh, and uh, we will continue working with you, I hope. Uh, uh, it has been a real pleasure. Uh, uh, Lorenzo Kilgren, uh, Catherine Kluber, Christian Heimann, and uh, Harry Paul uh, Normanda to have you. Uh, today uh, at CIDOP uh, to share with you uh, uh, and I hope we will continue working together. Thanks a lot for your presence uh, and we'll continue.